All right, great. Well, uh, thanks everybody for joining today. I hope I have some fairly exciting things to show you. Uh, some of these things you may or may not have seen just depends on how closely you paid attention to the updates that Power BI has released over the several, last several months. And uh, so I've titled the session, What's New in Power BI? But again, like I said, depending on how closely you're watching what's going on with Power BI, there may things, be things that happened months ago uh, that you're not even aware of. So we're going to really look at like the last four or five months and look at some of the new things that have, have been released and uh, do some quick demonstrations of those. I have been very, very limited on slides today because I have so many things that I want to show you that I literally have the slide you're looking at right now and an intro slide of me and then we're going into demos the rest of the time. So I hope you guys like uh, seeing a lot of hands-on uh, or at least a lot of demonstrations because that's what we're going to be doing today. Uh, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Devin Knight. Uh, I'm the training director here at Pragmatic Works, so anything training related that we do uh, usually goes through me in some form or fashion, uh, including I, I noticed that there was a lot of responses on the last question of the poll of, of what other tools besides Power BI you, you guys have uh, evaluated or are looking at. There was a high percent of uh, Tableau users. We're actually uh, beginning work on a new Tableau class, so be on the lookout for that uh, early part of next year if you are interested in Tableau. Uh, I'm also a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, and I've written several books uh, having to do with SQL Server. Now, you're not going to see me write a Power BI book precisely for the reason why we're doing this session. It changes so frequently. Um, I have considered, by the way, writing more of a digital version of a book, but um, you're not going to see many print books when it comes to Power BI, or really anything that's cloud-related, uh, because of how, how much it changes. Uh, in fact, we have a few folks that have worked with us here at Pragmatic Works that released a book that was based on the cloud method of doing big data, and by the time the book came out, it was already out of date. So they had screenshots that didn't even make sense anymore. So you won't see many books on Power BI. There are a few out there that you can find, um, but just note that a lot of times when you look at those, be, be careful because some of them can be out of date very quickly when it comes to Power BI. Uh, also, I run a local user group out of Jacksonville, Florida, so I'm from Florida here. And uh, I, I blog at a website called devonightsql.com. I do recommend you take a look at my website. I have a ton of blogs on Power BI. In fact, I have an ongoing uh, weekly blog on the Power BI custom visuals uh, that I'm about 25 or 20, 25 weeks into, I believe, right now. So I uh, recommend you take a look. And uh, you can, I'm actually 25 different modules of a free Power BI custom visuals course that I've, I've got out there now. All right, so uh, let me put this back up here as well. My contact information, if you do Twitter, if you'd like to email me later, that's fine. You can find that contact info here. But our plan for today, like I said, is very, very heavy on demonstrations. In fact, this is my last slide that I'm going to show you until the very end. As we're going to be going through a ton of different demonstrations to show you what's been released over the last several months. There's been a lot of fun stuff. I'm probably still not going to be able to get to all of it, but I'm going to do my best to show you a lot of the new things that have been released. And um, you're going to see a lot of fun things. There's been a lot of work on the data visualization side. Uh, so we're going to spend a little bit of time up front talking about uh, data extraction and things like that. Uh, but then we're going to get heavy into the data visualization things that have been updated over the last several months. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and close out my slides for a bit. And the first thing that I want to show you guys, which is a feature that I really like, is one that has to do with the query engine. And so many of you guys, I'm going to be opening up a lot of completed versions of stuff here today because I want to make sure I have enough time to show you as much as possible. So some of the things I'll build from scratch, some of them I have already pre-built. In this case, I'm going to open up a pre-built one here for this first example of today. Uh, now, the first thing that I want to show you, again, this has to do with queries. And if you work a lot on the query editor, if you work a lot with doing data manipulation inside of Power RBI, uh, you're probably going to really like this one. This is one of the uh, newer releases over the last couple months. Uh, gave you the ability to see dependencies between queries that you have. Okay, so what, what I've done is I've opened up an example, um, and this example in, in here has a data visualization. I'm not really focused on the data visualization at all for this example, uh, but what I do want to highlight for you over here on the right-hand side is the fact that you can see that there is one query are really one table that's being brought back for this data visualization, and that is called world data. Um, now, what I would like to show you here in this example is how you can actually see what dependencies this table has on the query editor, okay? So I'm assuming that you have some practice in Power BI. I'm assuming in, for this purpose of this session uh, that you have some introductory knowledge. I saw there was a lot of folks that were brand new to Power BI, uh, and I do recommend that you watch one of the intro sessions that we have if you are completely brand new to Power BI. We have all of them recorded on our website. We have a ton of them. 
So I am making some small assumptions that you know how to navigate around here today. But if you don't, just briefly, if any time you build out a solution inside of Power BI, if you ever want to change the query or edit the query that you're working on, you can do that by going up to the top ribbon area here and selecting Edit Queries. That's where you can uh, begin writing queries. You can actually begin by either going to edit queries here or by going to get data, and that'll allow you to get started by pulling some data in. And um, what we want to do is if we want to edit a query that's already been created, like we are in this case, we can simply select edit queries here, and this will launch open the query editor. So this is what the query editor looks like behind here. You can still see the data visualization, uh, but we're focused in on the query editor for this example. Now, one of the things I'll highlight for you, if you look over on the left-hand side of my screen, you'll see it actually says that I have four queries. But if you, you remember what we saw on the screen a few moments ago, there was actually only one. We only saw one, and that one was the world data query that we looked at a few moments ago. So the first question you might have is, all right, well, why aren't these other three showing up there? Well, the reason the other three aren't showing up is because they've been turned off, at least the functionality to enable the load. This, this option right here is unchecked. It's usually checked by default. And basically what enable load allows you to do is turn off the ability of those queries to load in a separate table. Okay, so basically well, here's what's happening in this example. I have these four different queries, okay, which you can see, oh, sorry, I guess the zoom's acting up a bit. I have these four different queries that you see on the left-hand side. Three of them are being combined into this one query in the bottom called world data. So if I'm combining the top three, then why do I need to bring all three of those together if I'm just going to combine them into one at the end anyways. So what I've done is I've right clicked on each of the top queries and I've unchecked the option called enable load. And when you uncheck that, that means it's not going to load those separate queries into the data model, it's just going to load the one here that I've combined the top three with. Now the reason I bring this up is this isn't really necessarily a, gr a, a brand new feature, uh, but the reason I bring it up is because this is something that you can actually visualize when you have a lot of queries inside the query editor. So if you work with, let's say you, you pull in dozens of tables, let's say you're looking at 20 something odd queries that you have to import to get all the data you need. And so this list becomes rather large. The nice thing about how the query editor works now with a recent update is you have the ability to vi visualize the dependencies between the queries that you have. So what I told you just a few moments ago is that these top three queries are dependencies, or really they're vice versa, the other way around. The world data one has a dependency on the top three queries. So the new feature that I want to highlight in this first demonstration is if you go underneath the view menu up in the top of the ribbon here, you'll find there's an option here underneath view called query dependencies. And when you select query dependencies, what you'll find is it launches open a new window here. Okay, let me unzoom for just a moment. And what this new window shows you is a couple things. First of all, it shows you where the data came from. Okay, so this top level here is showing you where the data came from. So that's the file that it came from. You'll then see when you select on these items that it actually shows you the path of how it got to the final query. So we have three queries. We have BMI, income, and population. The source for each of those queries is right above them. And then below, you'll see the final result, how these finally fed into the last query. You'll also see um, uh, below each of the query names whether or not the load had been disabled. Remember I told you there was an option there to uh, uh, uncheck enable load? And you'll see here that it also shows you that in the query dependencies where I can see which one of the queries are not being loaded to a data model. So when you see load disabled or loaded, that has to do with actually pushing the data from the query into the data model of Power BI. Now in this case, the top three queries have not been loaded into the data model. We saw that earlier over here as well. Um, and then the world data one has been loaded in my data model. Now the idea here, the great thing about this query dependency window is when you get to a point where you have dozens of queries, like I described before, maybe you have more than 20 uh, different queries, then this is a great place to go to not only be able to visualize them graphically, but it also shows you the path at how they're being used and what dependencies they have between each other. So that's the first little tip, first new item that I want to show you is the query dependencies. Okay, so first one knocked out. The next thing that I want to show you guys, and I'm actually going to bring open a brand new Power BI window for this, is um, a new way of being able to visualize query folding. Now this one came out about four or five months ago, but it's still something that I find a lot of people aren't aware of, and so I'd like to show this one so you can see really uh, what's going on behind the scenes when it comes to your data and how your data is being extracted from different sources. Now, if you're not really familiar with what the term query folding is, let me give you a, a quick description, maybe through an example to help you understand. 
Query folding is the idea of pushing the logic that is done in your query in Power BI back to the server. Okay, meaning rather than running queries on your local workstation, on my laptop for, for example, I'd actually like those queries to be run against the server, and that server has all the resources that I provided to it to be able to churn through that data and perform the query result that I needed to. So as an example here, let's say that I pull in data from a table that has roughly a billion rows in it. Okay, And of that billion rows, I really only need uh, about 10,000 of them. So let's say there's 10 years worth of data in there, and I only need the last six months worth of data, okay? And because I only need the last six months worth of data, uh, I want to be able to apply a filter to it. And when I, when I apply that filter to it, I want that filter to be pushed back to the server and not done on my workstation. I don't want all one billion of those rows imported on my workstation and then filtered. I want that filter to be applied on the server side. That's basically what query folding is. Now, until recently, the past few months, it was very difficult for you to be able to determine whether or not query folding was actually taking place. But with a recent update, it's been made easier to determine that. And I've showed this through, through, through a few other demonstrations that folks may have seen before, but it's worth highlighting here in a what's new session. So to get started with this example, I'm going to go pull in some data from a data source. Okay. And it's going to be my local instance here. And we're going to go connect to... Let me just search for the database. I'll hit OK. And the database that I'm going to choose today is the Wild World Importers DW. That's one of the newer sample databases that Microsoft has provided. And for this one, what I'm going to choose is the city table. All right, so I'll select city and click edit to bring that into the query editor. Okay, so I now have this data in the query editor where I can start to do data manipulation to it. I can start to filter down the data, make the data return back exactly what I want as opposed to everything that's in the table. Now, the way we can start to do things in here, let's say, let's start off with a simple example. Let's say that I wanted to filter down the, let's see, the subregion. I think it's the subregion here. No, that's not it. Let's see. Oh, it's a sales territory. Let's say that I want to filter down the sales territory here. Instead of bringing back all of the sales territories, I'd rather bring back uh, just the items from the southeast. And so I, what I can do is I can uncheck all here and say, bring me back just items that are in the southeast. Now, the way query folding works, uh, by default, assuming that you're pulling from a data source that's compatible with query folding, is as soon as I apply that filter, it's actually filtering it not on my local workstation, but it's filtering it through a query that's run against the server. And until recently, like I said, it was very difficult for you to be able to determine that, but now it's been made much easier for you to determine when query folding is taking place. Now, here's how you do it. So here's the new feature I'm, I've set you up to see here. To determine whether or not a query is folded, you would come over to the Applied Step section here on the right-hand side, and you would right click on the step that you want to validate is folded. Now, you can check any level of the steps. So let's say you had 10 different steps here. You can check any level of those steps because you can have a query that is partially folded. You could have a query that is partially done on the server and partially done on your workstation. And I'm going to give you an example of that here in a moment. But for this one, if you want to validate that this one step that we've done has been folded, you would right click on the filtered row step. And you'll see there's an option in here called View Native Query. And what View Native Query does is if you select that, and first of all, if it's even available to select, then that tells you query folding is working. If it's grayed out and you can't select it, like kind of like this move down option is, then that tells you query folding is not working. And, and there's reasons why that might be. But let's go ahead and select View Native Query here. You'll see what it does is it launches open a native query window. And the way that you can validate that query folding is actually working is look at the look at the query itself. If you look down at the query, you'll notice that I, it's automatically changed the query that's extracting the data out of my database, and it's added a WHERE clause to it um, in the native language of the database, which in this case is SQL Server, so it modified the T-SQL to be able to add in a WHERE clause for me. So in this case, query folding is taking place. Now, how do you know when query folding is not taking place? I told you that button is grayed out, but let me show you what that looks like. To prove out to you how this works, what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply a transform to this data set that query folding cannot do. And I'll explain why it can't, can't do that particular transform here in a moment. So let's say, for example, I looked and I found a column, let's say country, or let's go with state, that's fine. I found a column like state, and um, just imagine with, you, with, me, with me, if you will, that when you look at the state column, that the first letter was not capitalized. 
Okay, so you can tell here that it looks like it's got proper casing on every one of these, these values here. But let's imagine that those were actually lowercase values for whatever reason. If that were the case, and I wanted to do some kind of a transform to uppercase the first word of every uh, value that I have here, then I could right click on this column, and I could use a transform in here called capitalize each word. Now it's a really cool transform. It's a nice transform in that it'll look at the data and it'll capitalize the, 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 each word that you have inside of a result set. Now the problem with it is it's not compatible with query folding against SQL Server. And if you think about it, it really makes sense. The reason why it doesn't work is because there is no T-SQL statement inside of SQL Server that can capitalize the first word in each of your records. Uh, not, not even just your first word, each, each word, I should say. So if I select this, knowing that it doesn't exist in SQL Server, I know that query folding will not take place. And here's how you can validate that, is by going back over to the Applied Steps section over here on the right-hand side and right-clicking on that step. And you'll notice here this time that the view native query is grayed out. So that tells you that, in this case, it looks like uh, query folding did not take place. Now there's a lot of strategies that you can do. So it, when it comes to query folding, and this isn't really the focus of our session, so I'm not going to go too much deeper into this. I just wanted you to highlight where you can find this. There are a lot of strategies that you can do with the order of your transforms. So here's one rule of thumb that you should know. Whenever possible, you should move transforms or steps that cannot be folded, like this capitalize each word. You should move them lower in the query as, if, if possible. Okay, so if I added some other transforms in here that were able to fold, let me give you an example. Let's say that I added in another, uh, another column in here that combined the city and the state. So just to give you a quick example, don't worry so much about what I'm going to do here. I really want to kind of prove a point and then we'll move on. Let's say that I added in a new column that was both city and state combined together. Okay, so I call this city-state and I concatenate this with a comma and I concatenate that with the state. Okay, so all I'm doing here, by the way, is I'm combining the state, I'm sorry, excuse me, the city with a comma and then the state, and it's going to generate a new column, column here for me, which looks like this. Okay, it has the city and the state combined together. Okay, now you'll notice if I go look at the step section over here on the right-hand side that it's still grayed out. It's still grayed out on that new step that we just added, and the reason why is because any time that you have a query that uses a, uses a step that cannot be folded, anything after it will not be folded as well. So really the reason I bring that out up is because what I'm trying to get across is if you can change the order of these steps, say for example I move the added column above capitalize each word and there were no dependencies between each of those inside my data set, then I would benefit from that because it will actually push this last column into the query that we looked at earlier. So let me give you an example of what I mean. If I right click on added column and move it up so that it happens before capitalize each word, it will now be folded. Okay, it'll now be part of the query folding process. And the way I can tell that for sure is if I right click on added custom, you'll see view native query now appears here. And if I click on that, you'll see that the option here, uh, the T-SQL statement has been modified right here to add in that new column that we created. So the, the, the takeaway from this is any time that you use a step that cannot be folded, everything after that step will also not be folded. So you want to try and, try and reorder things so that it can kind of prioritize and, and push as much logic back to the server as possible. Okay? All right, I'm sure we have some questions on that. I'll try and make sure we grab some of those towards the end, but I want to move on because we've got a lot of other things to talk about. All right, so that's the query folding option. The new, the new feature I showed you there is the ability to right-click in the Applied Steps section and see View Native Query, and that shows you whether or not your query has been folded. All right, the next thing that we want to look at here is a, a new feature, and we'll be kind of quick on this one, is a new feature called Parameters. Now, um, for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually pull in some new data from the same database. I'm going to delete this query that we have here and bring in a new table. And so what I'm going to do is go to the Home option here, and we're going to go pull in from that same database that we did just a moment ago. And from this, uh, this time from the database, we're going to pull back a different table. I'm going to pull back the stock item table and hit OK. All right, so we're going to do an import here. So in this example, what we're going to do is I want to show you a, a, a very simple use case from, from a business perspective. You'll, you certainly could think of a better use case of this. But the way parameters work, and that's the new feature that we're showing you here in this example, uh, and they, the parameters have been out for about five months, uh, but I'm still not seeing a lot of people use them. The way parameters work is they're really more for the purposes of modifying the query results, not so much for the purpose of, of modifying the results that's shown on our report. 
So if you want to modify the results shown on a report, then you're going to use filters like slicers or just filters that you can apply to a report itself. Parameters are going to be more useful for filtering down the query result set behind the scenes. Okay, so if you come from a background where you've done maybe uh, integration services or SSIS, then this would be comparable to parameters or variables in SSIS. Okay, if you don't come from that background, don't worry about it. Uh, just know this is more for filtering the back end stuff, not so much for filtering the front end. All right, so a quick example of this, what I'd like to do is I'm going to show you that you can filter on this uh, item here, this column called color. You can filter on it by hitting the down arrow and selecting to do something like a text filter, or you can just uncheck an item here if you want. Now, there's one feature that you really want to make sure you turn on before you start to work with parameters, and it's not turned on by default. So let me show you where you can turn this on. Mine's already turned on, I believe, for this example, and you'll find it by going underneath the File menu and selecting Options and Options again, and underneath this menu, what you'll find, there's an option in here underneath query editor, and the option that you want to turn on here is this one right here called Always Allow Parameterization uh, in Data Sources and Transformation Dialogs. There's, some, there's a benefit from doing turning this on, and again, it's not turned on by default, so you want to make sure you go in and turn that on real quickly. Now, once you turn that on, you'll then be able to go into your filter, and let's say we apply a text filter here where we're just looking for one particular item, and when I apply this filter, you'll notice that there's this box right here which if I didn't turn on that feature I showed you a moment ago would not be here. So what this is allowing me to do is it's telling me here I can set this filter equal to a particular value just by typing in a value, or I can set it equal to a parameter by hitting new parameter here. All right, so if I hit new parameter, I can then uh, give the parameter a name, so we can call it something like color, and then I can tell it that I want to uh, have a particular data type for this parameter. Let's say that we want the parameter data type to be text, and then for the suggested values, we want to make it so that um, they actually are provided a list of values. So here's your three options. You can um, make it so it's bas basically an empty text box where someone has to type in a color. You can make it so that you can provide a list of values that the, you can choose from. That's meaning you actually manually type in values. Or you can populate values from a list or a query inside of Power BI. Okay, so for this example, what we're going to do is we're going to select a list of values, and I'm just going to type in a few values here. We'll type in something like uh, blue, uh, let's get in black, and let's do red. All right, then on the bottom here, you have two options where you can set the default value and the current value. These, are, these do have meanings that are different. The default value, picture it like this. The, the default value is if I were to close this, save it, and open it again, uh, it's going to refer to whatever the default value. The current value is literally what it is right now at this very moment. Okay, so at this very moment, what do I want the current value to be, which can be different than the default. So I could have the current value set to red, but the default blue. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit OK. Let me close that out. I thought I had that all shut down. And um, then I can hit OK once more, and that will apply the filter using my value of red. Remember, we created a, the, the current value set to red. You can also see over here on the left-hand side, underneath where you find the queries, you'll find where the parameter has been created. So we have a parameter called color. And if we go to that parameter, we can come in here and we can change the value right here if we wanted to. And as you change the value here to whatever you'd like, you'll notice it immediately impacts the results that are brought back from the query. So again, this is a, the, the reason why you use this to be able to filter down either the, uh, not, fil not always filtering, but to parameterize your query or maybe even your data source itself. So if I hit close and apply, let me real quickly here show you what the end result of this may look like. I'm going to load this in and then we're going to move on to something else. And the, la the last few examples we have will move pretty quickly. Okay. Um, one question, by the way, I see a lot um, in regards to parameters is how do you interact with them from Power BI service? So if I were to deploy this to powerbi.com, how do I interact with this? Um, well, keep in mind what I told you earlier. These parameters are more used for your query results. Um, and right now, as of right now, there is no interaction with parameters inside of powerbi.com or from the service. Not to say that won't happen eventually, but as of right now, there is no parameterization using what I've shown you so far inside the Power BI service. So if you want to filter down a report, then you're going to be using things like slicers. All right, so let's go ahead and bring in a few items here just so we can validate that this is actually working like we think it should be. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go ahead and place in here some kind of value, make it larger so you can see it, and then I'll show you how you interact with 
the parameter. So we can see right now it's filtered down to only show values that are considered black. If I wanted to change that parameter value, I can do that by coming up to the query uh, edit queries box here, and I can edit the parameter to change the value that's being used. Okay. All right. So if I hit the edit parameters, change this from black to blue this time hit OK, and then tell it to apply those changes. It's going to rerun the query again using that new parameter value that we just gave it. It'll take a few moments, and then it'll import this, showing that the value is blue. The last step of this, of course, is you can take the results of this, and you can build a template out of it as well that you can share with others. And I'll show you just where you would go for templates, because I do want to move on to the data visualization stuff, because there's a ton of data visualization that's been added inside of Power BI. All right, so we'll give that another second or two. And while that's going, I'm going to pop open a couple of my examples that I need to have ready for our next demonstration. All right, so you can see the results brought back blue now uh, based on the parameter value change that we made. So we changed the parameter value that's now visible here, and it's showing us the latest value. Okay, So that's parameters. All right, now the next thing that I want to highlight with you guys, again, we've got a lot of features I want to highlight. I will grab some questions. I see we've got a ton of questions. I'll make sure to look at those at the end here. The next uh, uh, demonstration that I want to show you guys is called inline hierarchies. Okay, so this is a newer feature, and what it allows you to do is have multiple ways of drilling deeper into your data. Okay, so let me make this a little larger so you can see it uh, really clearly. But what we're looking at here is um, a table, or sorry, a, a column chart that's bringing back a, a hierarchy of data. So it's got the year, the quarter, the month, and the day, and then it's also bringing back the sales amount. And you have multiple ways of now that you can interact with this. And really the, the point of emphasis here is going to be in the top left of this chart, right here in this section. Okay? And the option that we're going to be looking at here, more focused, but I'm, I'm going to really talk about all of them, is this option that you see right here. It almost looks like a, a hierarchy button almost. And basically what this one does is it allows you to enable and show the behaviors of an inline hierarchy. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like. If I select this option here, it says expand all down one level. Essentially what that means is it's going to go down to the next level, but it's expanding within the hierarchy that we're looking at. So right now when I push it one time, you'll see that not only are we seeing years, but we're seeing quarter along with it. Okay? So let me show you the difference between the two options we have here. One drills in and shows you both uh, the idea here of the inline hierarchy being that it shows you both year and quarter. But the other option that we have we can choose from is just more of a traditional go to the next level of the hierarchy. And so if I select this option, you'll notice this time it only shows quarter. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing every year, every year here, aggregate, aggregated at a quarter level. Okay? So instead of seeing the year and the quarter next to each other, we're just seeing the quarter by itself aggregated up for every year. Okay. Now, if you only wanted to see one particular year and drill in for that one particular year, let me show you how you do that. If you want to drill into, let's say, 2013, I don't want to see every year's quarters. I just want to see one year's quarters. I can select this button in the top right. This one says click to turn on drill down. And when you click on that option and you click on a bar or column in the column chart, this will actually drill into the year 2013 and show you just the quarters for 2013. This is different from the last one I showed you in that this is filtered down to the 2013 level, whereas the previous one was showing you the quarters for all years. Um, you can even, just to prove that out to you, if you look in the bottom right, you'll see here that there's a filter that's been applied where it says the, fil the year is 2013. All right, so there's a lot of ways you can play with this, and you can play with and see how you want to drill up the data. And they've given you multiple options for how you drill into the data. The new option here being the inline hierarchies is this one here, where you see both the quarter and the year together. And by the way, you can go another level deep. If I hit the button again, it'll now go down to the month level. And if I go another level deep, it'll go all the way down to the day level as well. So it kind of gives you a picture of what you can do here with inline hierarchies. And that's the option that we looked at in this quick demonstration. Okay. All right. Now, the next one that I want to look at with you guys is around tooltips and some new features that have been added around tooltips here. Uh, so I see one question in here that asked about the inline hierarchy. Sorry, just, I just, one just caught me out of the uh, corner of my eye here. Uh, the inline hierarchies does not have to be a true hierarchy, meaning that you don't have to actually come create a hierarchy object here. If you just have columns that you've placed together in the same field, in the field well, then uh, those all can be um, used in the inline hierarchy. They do not have to be a hierarchy that you've defined in the data model. 
All right, so the next thing I want to show you guys here is tooltips. Now, tooltips uh, have always been available in Power BI, and, and by the way, if you're not really familiar with what a tooltip is, that's basically when you hover above a column on a column chart, and you see this little item that, that hovers over the, uh, the bar or the column, that's a tooltip. Um, what they've added to tooltips is the ability to add new columns to tooltips that maybe not be part of the visualization otherwise. So what I mean by that is if you look over in the field list over here in the middle section right here, you'll see that inside this visualization I have the country and I have the sales amount, but you'll also notice down on the bottom here that there's an option here for tooltips. And the way that this works is you can take any measure that you have, so let's say for example I wanted to add in also the order quantity, I can add in the order quantity as a tooltip and then now when I hover above the value you'll see that order quantity has now been added to my tooltip. Now that's great, but the problem with tooltips here is that uh, it does not allow you to have text. And let me show you what I mean by that. If I were to go find a column that's text driven, like say for example the uh, region here, right here, if I wanted to add in the region to the tooltip, watch what happens. When I drag in region of the tooltip, you'll notice that what it does, instead of bringing back the text for the region, it actually does a count of the regions. And the reason that is is because, look at what happens here. When I do go to the tooltip, you'll see that it shows a count of five regions underneath the United States. And so what it does is it, it's all, it only by default allows you to bring in measures into the tooltip. Um, that's because, again, how does it going to show five different values underneath the United States? Well, there is a way to do it. There's actually a way that you can build out a calculation that shows you every value that is underneath the United States inside of a tooltip. But it does require you to create a little bit of a calculation. And so the calculation that I have today is uh, one that I have already written. I want to save a little bit of time. And this calculation that I'm going to use here, I'll be happy to share with you as well. But it's a quick little calculation. It is a measure. And basically what the measure does is it allows me to bring back text as a measure. Okay, so essentially what I'm doing here is I'm saying uh, go look at my uh, regions column and uh, if, it, if, your reg if my region column has um, more than one value, which we're going to look at here as another query option, I want to return back here as a comma separated list of all of the regions that I have. There's actually another function example that we could do here that's uh, there's a function called has one value and that kind of returns back a true or false and based on that you can actually uh, determine how you want to handle things here. There's multiple ways of working on this. But in this example, what I'm going to do is if I hit enter on this, okay, it's going to create a new measure for me called regions right here. And if I drag and drop that regions measure underneath tooltips, you'll see it'll give me a nice little hover over now or a tooltip now that actually shows the names of the regions. Before previously, it just showed the uh, number of regions, five, but now you can actually see that it has the names of each of the regions. Okay, um, one of uh, one of my uh, my buddies and a guy that works at Microsoft, Dustin Ryan, he actually has created a more advanced version of this, which I really like. I recommend you take a look at his blog. His blog is SQLDusty.com, and he had a more complex version of this that I'll, I'll plop in here. And what he did in his version is he said, well, what if I have you know 20 regions? I don't want to have a comma separated list of all 20 of the regions. What I'd like to do is if I go above a certain number of regions, I want to say, hey, there's more than this. And so what he's done in his example, which I just plopped in here, is he's done something like this. So notice what my region shows in the tooltip now. It has the first re three regions and then it says and more. So that's a little bit of a, slightly vari a slight variation of the function. Let me bring it up here for just a moment. And in his version of the function, which again, if you go to SQLDusty.com, that's his website, his, his blog, he shows you an example of how to do this. And in his, what he said is bring me back the top three regions, so basically do a count, bring me back the top three, and then if there's more than three, then just say and more here, okay? So there's some ways that you kind of work around this and play with it to make it a little bit more interactive, okay? All right, good deal. So that's uh, tooltips. Tooltips um, allow you to have a nice little hover over to see the values that are um, deeper into the data that you're looking at. All right, so let's go on to our next example. We're down to about 20 minutes, and i got a ton more to show you. The good news is these last couple will be pretty fast ones. This next one that I'm going to show you guys is table and matrix styling. Okay, so here's actually a completed example, but let's show you an example of one that, that hasn't been done yet. So um, in a fairly recent release, I think it's about three months old now, uh, table and matrix styling was released. So these are two tables and one, uh, sorry, a table and a matrix that you see on my screen here. 
And really what I want to show you is that there is some styling capabilities that have been added into Power BI. Styling meaning that you can just have some nice formatting on it. If you want to see things like alternating row colors, that's something you can do in here now. All right, so if you want to do something like that, you can select the visual. So I've got a table selected here. And I can select that table and then go over to the Format Paintbrush section right here. Okay, you'll see it says Format when I hover above that uh, paintbrush. And if I select that, you'll see there's an option in here called Table Style. Now, if you select Table Style, you'll see Style right now is set to None. But you can alternately change what kind of style is used. So if you want to do something like have an alternating row, you can select that. And then when I zoom out, you should be able to see what it looks like from my uh, table. You can, of course, change that if you want to see something like contrast alternating rows, something that has a little bit more contrast to it, you can select that. And let me put this one back to alternating rows, and let's take a look at the matrix. The matrix has the same capabilities. If you select the matrix here and go over to table styles underneath the format paintbrush again, you can select something like, uh, let's do the bold header and flashy rows, something like this to really give you a good view of the data. Okay, So this is another way of styling a matrix in this case for your purposes, for, for the purposes of a visual. Okay, so pretty easy to do, nice way to be able to insert some data in here. Now the next thing I want to show you is, that's a, that's a quick demo there, but that's table and matrix styling, another newer feature that's been released. The next feature I want to show you though is around slicers. There's been some updates to slicers fairly recently, uh, that if I go to another sheet that I have here, let's just go to this one here. If I go to another sheet like the one that we're looking at here, this is, it has a matrix in it, and what I want to do is maybe add in a way to filter down the data, okay? And so that the data that we're looking at here is showing um, its music data. And so it's looking at some of the top performing musicians uh, by country, and really it's country and year here. And so what I'd like to do is I want to be able to filter these down to look at just specific genres perhaps, okay? Uh, and I think I have a better example. Yeah, let's do this one. This is a bit of a better example. Let's do it on this table. And so what I'm going to do is this is actually an improvement on slicers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in the genre right here into the design surface. And it creates it as a table. And I'd like to switch this table to a slicer. Now slicers you'll find in the visualization section right here. If I select the slicer, this allows me to actually select items here to filter on the report that we see on the left-hand side. If I unzoom, you'll be able to see that it is applying those filters here. Now, the improvement that they've made is that now you can actually search through these slicers because previously you really had to kind of scroll through this big list and find the item that you wanted to filter and then select it and then hope you didn't deselect another one if you were trying to multi-select them. The improvement that they've done now is that you have the ability to actually search through the slicer with a search bar or search box. You'll find that search box if you go up to the very top corner here where you see the ellipses. Okay, so you'll see these three dots right here. If you click on those three dots on the uh, slicer, it brings you to more options. And then I can change it here where I can make it searchable. Right now, search is turned off. If I click on search, it now gives me a little search bar here where I can now type in a value, like let's say for example jazz. If I type in jazz, now I can search through my slicer and find things more easily. And I can select multiple items here if I wanted to. If I hold down control, I can select multiple items and it filters down my list. Okay? So just a little nice feature that's been added. Not too crazy, but that's something that's been a big request by a lot of people and that makes things a lot easier to do there. All right, so that's searchable slicers is that feature we showed there. The next feature I want to show you is conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is another feature that's been added fairly recently, uh, within the last uh, three months. And so the way conditional formatting works is it's, it, I feels like conditional formatting that I'm about to show you has a lot of room for improvement. So if you have questions on this, uh, don't worry, so do I. I want them to uh, improve a lot of the things that you can do with conditional formatting. But let me show you what is capable here, and then I'll try and address any questions that you guys have later. I think this is kind of a first investment into conditional formatting, what I'm about to show you, uh, but expect a lot more from this in the future. All right, so here's what I'd like to do. is I'm going to go back over to the, this original table that we worked on here. And so what I'd like to do is I want to add in conditional formatting on this value column that you see right here. So I have this value column, and what I'd like to do is I want to add some kind of conditional formatting on it. So that way I can see, based on a color, my values that have a higher variation between them. So the higher they are, they should have a certain color assigned to them. The lower they are, they should have another uh, color assigned to them. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to, to apply conditional formatting. 
you're going to go over to your field well. That's this area right here. This is your field section, and you can see all the fields that have been added into this visual. We're looking at a table right now. And if I want to add conditional formatting to this table, I would find the column that I want to, I want to apply that formatting to, which in my case is value. Okay, just to verify that, you can see value right here. Okay. And so if I want to apply conditional formatting to value, what you would do is you would hit the down arrow next to it. You'll see this down arrow right here next to the column you want to apply conditional formatting to, and you'll hit it. And then you'll come here to an option that's called conditional formatting. If I select that, it's going to launch open a new window here for me called conditional formatting. Let me zoom in on that again. And you have a couple of options here, but it really is a little limiting right now, so just be aware of that. Here's what you have the options to do. You can set a min and a max. You can also add in a third level. If you click on diverging, that'll kind of give you a cross section with another color that it diverges into it. Um, but let's leave that out for now. And as far as the min and the max, what it'll do is it'll say the minimum by default is going to be set to the lowest value you have in the data set uh, that's in the table. The maximum is going to be set to the highest value that you have inside the table we're working with. But you do have options to actually change that. If you wanted to hard code a number in here, and let's say you wanted it to actually be 40 be your min and your max to be... Um, you know, 500, you can come in here and modify it if you wanted to. You'll notice there's nothing really dynamic about it. You can't, so, so this is the part that my, my gripe with it is right now. I'd like to be able to set this to a field and make it dynamically driven, but unfortunately that capability is not here yet. The best you can do is you can dynamically uh, configure it by setting it to the lowest value that's inside your table or the highest value that's inside your table. You can also change the colors here, so if I wanted to make this something like a red color, uh, diverging from the blue, that's fine. You can do something like that. Let me make this a little bit more of a bold blue here. And if I hit OK on this, you'll notice what happens is it actually changes the color of the, co the table that we're looking at. And if I sort the values, you should be able to see some more reds appear in here. Okay, so you can see the top value, my maximum value was rock slash pop. And I can see that's the uh, beetles, and the beetles have brought back the highest values here. Okay. There's also another thing that we can do here that's worth showing you right now, which is, uh, so this feature here that we showed is called conditional formatting. Like I said, it's a little limited right now with what you can do to it. I'm hoping some big, big things to come to it uh, in the future. The other thing that we can do here that's kind of in the same area that we looked at a moment ago is called quick calc, C-A-L-C, -C, quick calc, or stands for quick calculations. And what we can do is if we want to create a quick calculation, check this out. This is a pretty neat value. What I've done is I added the value column a second time here. Okay, so let me make this a little small, smaller here and make the text a little larger here so you can really see what we're looking at. All right. Okay. And let me make that a little larger so you can actually see it. There we go. All right. So in this one, what I've done is I've added another column in here for value a second time. And what I'm going to do with the second column for value is I'm going to use something called a quick calc. Okay, so quick calc, what it'll allow me to do is if I go back over to my field well, and if I find the column for value, you can see value is in here twice. The order of these are the same order that they appear here. So I see value one has conditional formatting on it, value two does not. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the second value column that I see here, and I'm going to hit the down arrow, and I'm going to use this option in here called quick calc. This one came out uh, probably about four months ago. The conditional formatting is newer than this. But if I select Quick Calc, I, I really see some, uh, some future for this one. This is a cool option. If I select Quick Calc, you'll see it opens up a new dialog box for me. And what I need to do in here is right now it says there's no calculations available, but that's because I need to tell it that I want to summarize it first. So um, you've you got to tell it what do you want to do with the value. Well, I want to summarize it. And then you have the option below, once you select some kind of, kind of an aggregate here, whether you're summing or counting or doing a min or a max, you need to select some kind of aggregate. And then below that, now you can use this option here where it says show value as, you can tell it that you want to show it as a percent of total. This is a really cool option, and I, I can envision they're, they're probably going to add quite a few quick calcs to this list eventually. Right now, percent of total is the only one here, but check out what it does. If I select percent of total and hit OK, notice what happens to this now. So now I'm looking at the percent of total for each of these values that we have. And this percent of total also takes into account if you add in some kind of filter. So if I went and started filtering by genre, it would recalculate that on the fly each time a filter is applied. So it's a really cool option here called percent of total, and it's something that you can do without having to write a ton of DAX. It actually does it all for you. It's a really neat feature. All right. 
Great. And that's uh, we just showed a couple of options there. So uh, hi, just for a reminder, what we showed there that was called Quick Calc, C A L C. All right. Now the next one that I want to show you guys, the next demonstration is going to be the analytics pane. The analytics pane is fairly new. It's about two to three months old, and there's been some new features even added to it since its release. Okay, we got about ten minutes left, so I'm going to try and get as much as I can here. The quick, uh, sorry, the uh, analytics pane is a neat one because what it allows you to do is add in new features uh, into your visual. So, for example, here we're looking at a column chart and we're looking at uh, insurance claims by year. And let's say I wanted to see some kind of a line added to this column chart that showed me the median of claims that have been have been added, or the median of all the claims that are listed here. To do that, you would go to the analytics pane, and the analytics pane is found right here. Okay, so it's right next to the format paintbrush. To the right of that is where you'll find the analytics section. And there's all kinds of different analytics options that you can add in here. And for the purposes of this one, I want to add in a median line. And so what I can do is I can turn on a median line here. I can add one. Okay, so it's added in a line here called median line one. Let me zoom out so you can see that. So you can see the line has been added. So that's the median of all my records. And then I can change the name of that line if I wanted to. So I can come in here and say, well, let's just call it median. I don't want to call it median line one. That's kind of silly. But then what I can do is I can come in here. I can change the color if I want. Let's say, for example, I want to make it red. Take a look at what happens when I make it red. It's a little easier to read now. You can also do things like uh, change the way the line is visualized. So if I want to add in a data label, for example, you can turn on a data label, which you now see shows up right here. Okay. I can then take it a step further and say, well, on that uh, data label, let's make that data label not blue. That's kind of an odd color to look at. So let's make that data label's color black. And then let's make it so that it's visible in billions. So you can add in some kind of unit of measure here if you wanted to. So I want to add this in as a billions. And then if you look at it here again, check this out, you can see in here that it says 6.55 billion is my median line. How do I know that's what that is? Well, I don't really have any label on here to tell me that's median, so check this out. There's one other thing we can do. We can come back over to our properties here, and where it says text, there's a property right now where it's pointing to value. We can make this, instead of only showing value, to show the name and the value. And check this out. The name is the name of the line here, so it's going to call it median. So if I call this name and value, check out what it looks like now. So now we can see this is the median at 6.55 billion. So that is the analytics pane. Just a quick example of how you use the analytics pane. Pretty nice, nice little feature to add in, and it makes it much, um, there's, there's a few other settings you can go in, and I'm going to show you one other option of the analytics pane here in a few moments. All right. All right, so for the next couple options, I'm going to show you some uh, features that are actually in preview. Uh, we're going to look at some like doing mobile formatting, we're going to look at forecasting, uh, date slicers, a bunch of them that I'm going to try and show pretty quickly here. So I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll even hang around a few minutes late to answer some of the questions because I know there's a ton of them, but I do want to show a lot of these cool new features that uh, are fairly new. The next one here though I'm going to show you is called mobile report layout. This feature is still in preview, so I'll need to show you where you can turn this feature on if you wanted to do this new one. So again, what this feature that I'm showing you now is called, it's called Mobile Report Layout. And so what I'm looking at is a report that I already have designed. And if you want to turn on the ability to format a report for mobile, there's an option by going underneath the File menu, File and then Options, and then Options again. There's a section here specifically for preview features inside of the Power BI Desktop. So you'll find them right here underneath Preview Features. And you can check off as many or as few as you want. And uh, as you check them off, it will require you to, you to restart uh, your Power BI desktop. Okay, so make sure you go ahead and check off the, the features that you want to use. Here I've checked off a few of them that I want to show you today. So I'll hit OK. And the first feature that I'm going to show you is the ability to do mobile report layouts. You'll find mobile report layouts by going underneath the view menu up in the top section here. Again, it's a preview feature, so you've got to turn it on first. Once it's turned on, though, you'll see there's an option here called Change Layout underneath the View menu. And when you select Change Layout, what it will do is it'll give you a view of what it would look like on a mobile device. And so what you're doing here is you're specifically designing it for mobile. And so I can come and drag these items in. You can drag them in, resize them. And this is how, again, how it's going to appear on a mobile device. And so I can kind of plop these in however I prefer to see them, resize them properly for mobile. And this is, again, a specific view for mobile reports here. 
And so whenever someone goes to view this on a mobile device, this is how it will appear to them. If I want to send it back to the view we had a few moments ago, I'll hit the Change Layout button again. And when I do, it'll send it back to how it was. Okay, so that's the mobile options, uh, mobile layouts, basically. Okay, all right, the next one I'm going to show you here is also a pretty quick one to show. This one has to do with um, grid lines, snap to lines and grid lines. It's under the same menu we're already looking at. So underneath the view menu here, this is also a, a preview feature. If I hit the show grid lines and show uh, snap objects to grid, what this will allow you to do, look at my design surface now. It may be kind of hard to see on the screen, but there's dotted lines on here that's showing me a grid of where I can lay things out. And so what I can do now is as I resize these, it's hard to actually experience this without you being the one driving it, but things will actually snap to the grid for me. So as I move, it'll snap to anywhere that there's dots, and then it makes it much easier for resizing things and making it so that each item in the dashboard is of the same size. That option, again, is under the View menu. It's called Show Grid Lines and Snap Objects to Grid. Okay. All right, the next one I want to show you is Forecasting. This is also a preview feature, a really cool feature. And as that one comes up, I'm going to go ahead and open up another one as well. <clears throat> and in this one, what we'll see is the ability to actually have forecasting using the Analytics pane. Again, this is a feature that's in preview right now. I'm trying to open up a couple of demonstrations here. But the forecasting option is pretty neat. It'll work on line charts like you see here. And the way it works is you select the chart, you go over to the analytics pane, which you find over here, okay? And you select underneath the analytics pane. If you're using a visual that supports forecasting, like a line chart, you'll see there's a new option here underneath the forecast section where you can add a forecast. And if you select it and turn it on, check out what happens. It actually adds a forecast for what the next 10 units, in this case 10 years, is going to look like. So it's looking 10 years into the future and showing me uh, what my results are going to look like. Now if you've ever worked with anything like data mining or predictive analytics, machine learning, any of the keywords for that, you probably have realized that 10 units ahead is pretty far in advance to be trying to predict. Usually you want to try and predict three to five units into the future. And so you have the ability down here at the bottom to actually change the number of units that it looks forward. So if I want to look five units ahead instead of ten, I can change that here to show five. And that way now it's actually looking five years into the future instead of ten years. Now you do need to hit the apply button here to make that actually turn on. But now I'm looking, looking five years into the future based on the forecast of the previous results. So again, it's looking at historical results to be able to predict on the future, or forecast for the future. Uh, pretty cool feature. You can play around with this some if you wanted to. You could actually look back in time as well. So you can tell it that I want to ignore the last five years worth of data. And let's say, for example, I wanted to look 10 years in the future, but I wanted to also um, go back five years. This way you can actually validate how accurate your forecast is. So you'll notice when you go back five years or back five points, it's going back and it's showing you what it would have predicted uh, based on the results that um, uh, it had prior to that. Okay, and now I'm also looking five years into the future as well. All right, so now these predictions are always dependent on how much data you have to pass in. So the more data you have to pass in, the more accurate it can be. There's a lot of factors that go into that. All right, that's forecasting. There's a lot of fun things you can do with forecasting. And there's other ways you can do forecasting in Power BI as well now. All right, next one here is the time slicer. There's a new type of slicer, and it's really based off the old slicer. Let me show you how you can use this one if I bring in a slicer and I put a date, it has to be a date data type, if I bring a date into that slicer, you'll have a time slicer. This is a, this is a brand new feature as well. With the time slicer, you now have the ability to select a range of dates, okay? So it's set to doing a between right now, and it, based on that between is it's realigning my chart based on this new time slicer. This is a regular slicer that just has a date applied to it. You can also change what type of slicer it is to say, well, I only want to see values before this date, or I only want to see values after this date, or I don't really care to have this time slicer, just show me the slicer like I would normally see it. And if you select the list view, it just gives you a list of dates that you can select from. So this is actually just an improvement on the old slicer that allows you to interact with the data through a kind of a slider that you see here. All right. Now, I'm, I'm saving the best for last because we only have two minutes. I really, really want to show you this last feature. This is one of my favorite new features that just came out about two weeks ago, and it's called grouping and binning, okay? And so I want to show you this one. If we have time for one other, we'll do, we'll do that. 
but I really want to show you this feature. This is one of my favorite new ones uh, because what this does is it really helps. Um, one, one, of the big one of the big gripes that people had about Power BI is some features that it was missing that Tableau had. And so this is a feature that Tableau has, has had for a little while and Power BI has now added. And it's, it's called grouping and binning. You can think of grouping to be used for text values. Binning is to be used for more um, numeric values, okay? So more for your measures that you're going to use. And it's kind of used for doing things like histograms. I'll show you that here in a minute. Now let's talk about grouping first. The way grouping works is you can select items. So we're looking at a column chart here that's showing me all of the states and the uh, sales that I have by state. And so what I can do is I can select the states. Well, let me multi-select the right way. Here we go. Hold down control. I can select the states that I want to add into a group. Let's say these four right here. And if I right click on any one of those four, it will allow me now to place them into a group. All I had to do was right click on it. So if I select group, it's now going to place them into a group for me. Okay, that's what it's done here. And you may want to kind of change around how this data is visualized because here's what's happening over here in the field well now. You'll notice it's created a brand new field for me. Check this out. It's created a brand new field. It's inside the data model now called uh, state province groups. And what you'll likely want to do with this is actually replace the axes with that new field. And check out what happens when you do that. When you do that, now you can see um, your group on the left-hand side and then other showing up on the right-hand side. Now it defaults to showing everything else as an other bucket, but you can actually remove that other. Let me show you how you can do that. If I don't want to see other, and I actually want to see this group and all the other ones, you can do that by going over to the group that was created right here. This is the icon for groups. And if I right click on that, I can select that I want to edit the group right here. So if I hit edit groups, I can tell it that I want to say, for example, rename this group and call this my high sales states. And then I can rename this other one to, rather than being called other, I can rename it something else as well. Or I can uncheck this include other group. So if I uncheck this include other group, what happens is it doesn't have the other group. It actually just lists all of them out. So check it out. Here's my high sales states, and then here's everybody else. So if I wanted to, I could filter that out, or I can do really whatever I want now that I've kind of changed and created that group. I may have done the opposite. Maybe I have a low volume state and combine them together. There's different ways you can approach it. Now that's grouping. The other thing is called binning. And so let's show you how binning works. Binning is pretty easy to do as well. Uh, to do binning, what we'll do is we're going to go find a table that has a measure in it. And so I have my sales table right here, and we're about to wrap up, guys. Uh, I have my sales table right here, and I can see inside my sales table that I have a quantity column. And so if I want to maybe create a histogram out of this, so I can have, here's all my orders that had uh, at least 10 quantity, and here's all my orders that had at least 20 quantities sold, and here's all of them that had at least 30 quantities sold. What I can do is I can create separate bins for quantity here. It's almost kind of like uh, uh, discretizing the data there. Uh, so here what I can do is if I right click on quantity, I can tell it that I want to group quantity. And when I tell it to group a measure value, notice what happens. It's a different, it, it, although it's the same feature called grouping, because of the data type of that value, it realizes that I'm really trying to bend them. I'm trying to create buckets of values here. And I can tell it how large do I want the bucket to be. Do I want it to be in 10 increments of 10 or increments of 20? Whatever I want to do, I can change that here. And maybe I want to make it increments of 15. I can change that here. Hit OK. And now when I bring this into a report, let's make this into a column chart here, uh, this one here, and then let's add something like um, the orders right here. Notice what this looks like now. So now we're looking at bins, and these bins are in 15, minute, 15 increments, 15 quantity increments. And when you hover above it, you can see these are all my orders that had zero quantity sold. Here's all my ones that had 15, 30, 45, 60, uh, 75, so on and so forth. So we've basically created a little histogram here based on the fact that we bend our quantities that were sold. Okay, it's a pretty cool little feature that you can add in. Uh, very nice capabilities. One other one there I'll show you very quickly. It's an easy one to show. There's also new filtering capabilities. So if I want to include or exclude certain values, say for example, uh, I want to exclude Colorado for whatever reason 
or Arkansas, whatever, whatever I want to do. If I want to remove a certain value, you have a new feature here as well that you can right click on a value and you can either include or exclude it. So if I select exclude, what, you'll notice what happens, Colorado is now gone. I can do the same thing to Florida here. And what it's doing is it's applying a filter that's a very visual way of adding that filter, but you'll see that filter show up underneath the filter section here. So you can see my excluded items, Colorado and Florida. You also have the ability to include only certain objects. So if I selected certain states here and I only wanted a report that showed those four states, I could select them, then right click and say include, and that's only going to filter to show the, only those four states. That's another new option that's been fairly re recently released. All right, I'm over on time, and I got to just about every one of them that I wanted to show. A lot of cool new features. Um, I'll take a few moments here to answer some questions. Um, Let's see, what do we got? Uh, have you had a chance perhaps to get any of these up and running? I see there is a question about the Tableau class I mentioned. We're looking at about a January or February time frame for that. Um, let me bring my contact info up here as well. So if you have some other questions you want to make sure you're able to get to me, I will bring that up. So my contact info is right here. Uh, if you guys don't want to hang around, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit around for about five minutes or so to try and get as many questions as I can. Uh, if you don't want to hang around, no problem at all. But uh, let's see how many of these I can burn through here. So, uh, Liz, do you have any kind of queued up that I can look at? Uh, no, because there's, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, <laughs> I will just say real quick, I know a couple of people have asked, um, just in case you're dropping off. Um, this session was recorded, as always, and you guys will receive an email tomorrow with a link. So, um, let me see Great. if I can pull some for you real quick. Uh, no problem. So I'm looking at a couple here. Uh, what model does it use for uh, forecasting? Yeah, so it's kind of running. That's a great question. You know, kind of the question is around the forecasting option that I showed earlier. Um, it's interesting because it's kind of running some internal forecasting very quickly. There actually is a separate visual that you can import as well for being able to do um, more of an R uh, version of forecasting as well. So there's a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, to, be, to be completely honest, I am not sure what the forecasting and the method that it's using for the analytics pane and how it's different from the R visual. Uh, they may be doing exactly the same thing, uh, but they've just made it easier to do through the analytics pane. Uh, just to be completely honest with you, I'm not sure how the, the difference is there. I see a question popped in. What's the purpose of doing binning? It's really for the purposes of kind of doing like histograms. So if you're not familiar with histograms, it's a great way to be able to visualize things to see how many items you have um, or how many items fall under a certain measure. So for example, what we did in our scenario here, uh, this is actually a different demo. Let me open up the one we were just working on. So the, pur the purpose here is to be able to see a grouping of how many of a certain uh, measure that you have. So uh, let's say I want to know all of my customers that are buying between $5,000 and $10,000 worth of my product. Then I would want to be able to do a bin, and that way I can see very easily a count of how many customers are buying between five dollars and $10,000 of my product because I've now created a bin for them and I've visualized it out on a histogram like this. So that's kind of the purpose of, uh, of doing that as well. Uh, Marlene asked the question, will Power Query keep up with Power BI? Uh, they're doing an okay job of that. I, well, I, I take that back. See, Marlene's question kind of goes around, you know, Excel Power BI versus Power BI Desktop. Uh, if, if you've ever, you know, spoken with anyone from the Excel team, they definitely are a little bit slower integrating a lot of these features in. Uh, there's a lot more uh, steps that they have to go through to integrate some of these new and great features that you have in the Power BI desktop into features like Power Query for Excel. Um, and so I think they're constantly going to be playing catch up a bit, uh, but they have actually had some fairly recent releases for Power Query in, in Excel. Uh, unfortunately, those releases did not include some of the things I showed today. So for example, you weren't, you're not going to see the query dependencies there yet. Um, they're working on some ad added features for the parameterization. The template stuff is not there yet, so uh, definitely a ways to go to keep up from the Excel perspective. Uh, let's see what else. Can you change the color of the styling? Okay, so Ricardo's question is uh, regarding the styling that we showed earlier. Let me see if I can open that example up real quickly again. Let's see, here it is. Uh, short answer is no, <laughs> but let me show you. There, there are a few options. Um, I, you know, actually, I take that back. That's, that's not true. There, there is a few styling options that you have, um, and you'll actually see them. If you look at the Power BI blog that they did the announcement on, they, they announced there is some ways to adjust it. 
it's just a little limited. Um, I, 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 I think my short answer is probably correct. You're, you're kind of limited to what you see here. Uh, if you want to go beyond what you see in this drop down here, um, you kind of kind of out of luck for the time being. But uh, the good news is that it's that functionality is there now. So I'm excited to see what uh, they can hopefully add in to, to enhance that a bit more. Uh, let me see if I can grab another question here. Uh, can we? Work? I'll take one, well, at least one last one here. How does the search perform if there's a lot? So this is uh, Sanal earlier had the question. I think the question was around the searchable slicers capability. So his question says, how does search perform if there are a lot of values uh, like parts? So his, his example is I have a lot of part numbers. I'm trying to search through all these part numbers in a slicer. Uh, just to give everyone else some context to the question, let me open up the searchable slicer example here real quickly. The, um, it, it, you can see some performance degradation, but keep in mind, you're all, depending on how you've pulled in the data, it really may vary. So if you're using more of the in-memory capabilities of Power BI, which is the default import of the data, then you'll see a little bit less of an impact of performance as opposed to if you were doing more uh, of the real-time, uh, meaning doing something like the... Um, uh, direct query, that sort of thing. Now, I think the slicer itself, the way that it performs, it's more interactive. See, so it's not terrible. They've actually done a pretty good job in how they've done the searchable slicer here. So I'm going to try to give everyone else some context of what we were talking about with searchable slicer here. I've added a searchable slicer back into this visual, and um, this is where I came up here and I typed in the word jazz, and I saw that it was able to bring back. So the question he has is, if I have, let's say, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of part numbers to search through here, how does it perform? In my experience, I haven't seen a ton of performance degradation, and I've had a couple thousand. Now, you might be looking at tens of, or maybe even hundreds of thousands, and you may see a little bit more performance problem, but um, I haven't noticed any yet. So just to speak from my experience, I haven't seen, a, seen any performance problems. But I can imagine you might, obviously, when you try to start to get into the tens, if not hundreds of thousands. All right. Uh, anything? I think. Well, I'm out of time here. I'm already 10 minutes after. So, guys, what we'll do is, is uh, Liz will send me those questions. I try. I try and try to go back and review some of these questions and write on them later. Uh, make sure to ping me if, I, for some reason, I don't. I'll put my contact info back up here again. Uh, so, if you do you have any questions, you can reach out through that manner as well. Hope you guys enjoyed the session. You guys have a great uh, rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Devin.